Welcome, everybody. We're still waiting for a few more people to show up, but we're glad you could join us. Okay, so should we uh, should we start? Well, let me let me share my screen. So I'm I'm Tim Hickey. I'm the chair of the computer science department uh, for the last couple years, and we have several faculty and staff here who you'll you'll meet over the uh, the course of this presentation. Um, let me share my screen and uh, do our PowerPoint here. So today we're going to talk about the Masters in Computer Science for non-majors, our MS4 program, uh, which is, I think, a great opportunity for a lot of students. Um, there's a huge demand in the U.S. for people with computer science degrees um, and just a huge need. Uh, we see, you know, re demand for machine learning specialists, for web and mobile app development specialists, uh, just almost every industry uh, has an increasing demand for people who have uh, strong skills in computer science. All the computational linguistic stuff, uh, Amazon and Siri and all of that. Um, so we have developed this program precisely for that. There are a lot of students who get a major in one area and then decide they want to try computer science because they, they realize um, that it's uh, in high demand, it's a lot of fun and exciting, and you can do things that will really make a huge difference in the world. So welcome. We're glad to see you here. Um, this is the agenda. So uh, we'll do some introductions and then give a, um, a Bert Shue will give an overview of the MS4 program, and then we'll talk about the placement exam, application, uh, financial aid, I'll introduce some of the faculty who are here who can talk about the courses they're teaching and their research. Uh, I'll kind of go overview of all the faculty just to give you a brief overview of everyone. Uh, and then Iraklis will talk about career paths and internships. Then we'll have a student panel and some questions and answers. So uh, I'm the chair of the department. Uh, Nian Wen Shui is, you want to wave your hand? Here. Yes, here. He's our Director of Graduate Studies, uh, Michael Golitsen, Operations Manager, uh, Anne Gudaitis, the Graduate Program Coordinator, Hello. Uh, Justice Penny, our Department Coordinator, uh, and then we have lots of faculty and, and staff that you'll meet along the way. Um, so why don't we start with having uh, Bert give us an overview, Nyan will give us an overview of the MS4 program. Okay, so here I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the course requirements for um, the MS4 program. Um, the, the general idea, before I talk to, uh, specific about the um, actual courses, the general idea of the program is to um, <clears throat> make up for the core requirements uh, that are you know, on the, from a typical CS undergrad. And then on top of that, um, as you, you take like nine courses, uh, elective courses, um, that are typical for a master's degree. Right? So the core, uh, the four um, core courses um, providing this fundamental background uh, in computer science is CoSci 12, 12 B, which is you know our um, our code. Uh, so it is this is Java programming, advanced Java programming, uh, and then there's uh, there's CoSci 21, that's the uh, data structures, uh, and then the uh, 29 that would be a uh, computational theory, and then uh, there's 131, which is open system. So these are the kind of the basic. Um, core courses that I think we absolutely need um, in order to move on to graduate study. Um, so we have a little bit of a different kind of requirements for those courses because they are um, they are um, you know they are courses that are for undergrads. So, um, in terms of like the um, you know in a typical graduate level course, you can get a you know B minus to pass, but this but these courses you have to have a B plus. Right? So. Uh, and then on the, the rest of this is really simple. So all the other courses are going to be elective courses in that uh, you are not, um, so we do not, do not require that it's, you have to take some courses with the others. Um, so we offer a range, wide range of courses in the uh, department. Um, so, so I do not necessarily remember all of this, what its courses mean, but uh, mm -hmm. so we have, you know, like a, a lot of courses in um, machine learning uh, because there's a risk we have more recently, in recent years, we have recruited uh, several uh, faculty members in, in this area. So, you know, based on the uh, on the demand, uh, we also have the traditional courses in database management, uh, in in, uh, in theoretical, you know, the computer science, 
uh, in, um, in education technology uh, in uh, natural language processing. So natural language processing is, uh, so we have a separate program, uh, which is the CO in computer science, uh, a computer lingu computational linguistic program, uh, just for that. Right? So, but some of those courses also come towards the CS degree and you can take some of that courses from there. So essentially that's the, um, that's the general um, mixture. So you have some fundamental courses that are um, served as in like a preparation. And then you have the um, regular kind of master's um, grade level courses. Okay, so, so I kind of like already uh, sum up those courses already. Like, so, uh, so these folk um, you know, in the previous slides, those, there are numbers there. So here you can match up with their um, the actual content. You know, B is advanced program techniques. This teaches Java, uh, I believe. Uh, um, yep. And then, uh, and then there's data structures. So data structures, you know, it doesn't matter what you know specific language you have. Good. So these are fundamental uh, computational you know, concepts. And then 2029 20, is the discrete structures. Um, and then the uh, 131 is operating system. And then there's you know, like eight additional 100 um, plus level electives I mean, in many kind of different areas that uh, the faculty here have expertise, expertise in. Um, so, so next slide. Um, okay. All right. So um, yeah. So here is some sample courses. Like uh, in like. Uh, uh, so there is a. Um, so in addition to the trophy in the first semester, uh, if you um, come here and these are the courses that you would expect to to do. Um, you you're gonna take um, trophy and 29A because these are the prerequisites for a lot of the uh, electives. So you want to take this first. And then uh, the other courses that uh, do not require the, the uh, you know, these as prerequisites include you know, the soft and software in, uh, entrepreneurship uh, and computer supported cooperation and introduction 3D animation and uh, fundamentals in that language processing. Uh, so, but you know, for that, the last one has a footnote so if you have to uh, meet the prerequisite there, so that's the one of the uh, NLP course, first NLP course uh, in the CL program. Uh, so, but it also comes towards the CS uh, degree. Um, so, next slide. Um, um, so, right. okay, go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, yes. <laughs> so, the placement exam. So, because people come from different backgrounds, we want to make sure you're set up for success in the program. And the placement exam helps us determine what is the right course to start with. Um, if you have some computer science experience, you end up in 12B, and this is the first really starting course in the program. However, if you have come with no background whatsoever, that's absolutely fine as well. You can start with COSI 10A um, that teaches you the, the, the basic fundamentals that builds your foundation. Now, if you have time between now and the start of the program and you want to, and you don't have the background and you want to jump ahead of uh, and go straight into 12B, there is some information on the next slide that it has a link um, to the description of the, uh, the placement exam and how you can prepare for it better so that you can, you know, rock, you know start up your education faster, uh, propel your education faster. Now we're gonna get a copy of these uh, slides, so don't worry about writing down the placement link, but um, that's where you would find out more information about it. Okay. So this is my part. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the open house. And I'm so glad to have you all here. Um, as Tim said, I'm the graduate program coordinator and um, part of the administrative office with Justin and Michael. And um, I mainly dedicate myself to graduate students with regard to admissions and um, all manner of ad administrative issues um, while the graduate students are in residence. So um, I hope you're all holding up well in these unusual times. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I just wanted to briefly go over our application um, requirements. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. We have uh, an online application portal where you go to to begin um, um, you know, submitting your materials. Uh, we require two letters of recommendation. They can be from a professor you had um, at any any um, educational institution you were enrolled in, or it could be a workplace supervisor or a business associate. So we, we accept those two different kinds of um, recommendations. We would like your transcript from any university or college you attended. 
a personal statement. Um, we just really like you to kind of indicate your reasons why you're undertaking um, graduate study and kind of describe for us your qualifications for the program and why you want to come. Um, it doesn't have to be a tome. We get two, three pages usually um, submitted for that. Um, or your resume CV. Um, and then this year, due to COVID, we are waiving the GRE requirement um, on a one-time basis, um, just because we know it can be difficult for students right now. Um, but however, we do strongly recommend it if it's all possible to take, because we found that it's a really great way for us to kind of evaluate the success of our students from, from those, you know, how well you will do if we have those scores. So, but no pressure, your application will be considered um, whether you're able to submit it or not. And I just wanted to make that clear. Um, and then lastly, um, um, in the next slide, I think that we have a Q&A thing or just, yeah. We have strong applicants from many different backgrounds like yourselves. And if you haven't taken a programming course um, or many undergraduate um, math courses, um, you might wonder how you can prepare. And Michael had mentioned before with the placements test, we do recommend it would um, to take one programming course just so you kind of get an understanding of, of um, programming and decide whether you like it, even like it or not. Um, so we suggest a Python um, or Java or possibly a discrete math class. But if wherever you are, and if you find a particular class in your area or, area or online, you could just email us and we can just sort of look at it and approve it um, if you're interested in preparing, like say in the spring uh, for a fall application. So yeah, so just feel free to write to us about that. Um, and that's kind of about it. Um, oh, one last thing. We offer you a fee waiver code for attending this uh, open house. So CS2021, if you put that in, we will waive the $75 application fee. So I hope you guys will do that. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Um, and there's the link to the portal, which everybody can okay. get the slides, right? So they'll have that link. Yes, exactly. Um, and financial aid. Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Justin, the department coordinator. I handle a lot of the financial end of things, especially if you are accepted and become a teaching assistant. So I would like to talk to you about that really quick. I'm glad everybody could join us. Uh, financial aid. Every student who is admitted to the master's program receives partial financial aid. The average for this past year um, is 20000 per year. So generous. Um, Work opportunities, many of our students obtain teaching assistant positions in their second semester once they've taken classes and have built relationships with those faculty members. So I just wanted to talk about that for one moment. Um, we don't have a formal application process for becoming a teacher's aide. So basically you're going to come in and take the introductory classes, make the fact that you would like to be a teacher's aide known to the professors and get on their radar. Um, professors always select people based on interest and also ability. Same goes for the next line, which is research assistant positions are available for specific faculty, but this is also based on the faculty needs if they have a project coming up and if you are interested in the area of research that that would be. On campus positions in other departments are also available. So if there's any questions with that, please don't hesitate to contact us at compsci at brandeis.edu should you be accepted. Okay, uh, thank you, Justin. Um, so now I want to introduce um, uh, Olga Papamanuel, the Vice Chair of Computer Science, and then Professor Pito Salas, and they'll talk a little bit about the courses they teach, maybe their research also. And we have several other faculty here, so I'll have them um, come in and briefly talk about their courses and their research. Um, but why don't we start with Olga, so here, and here are the courses that they have been teaching recently. So hi, everyone. Uh, we're very glad to be here today. So my name is Olga Papa Emanuel, and uh, my research area is on databases. 
and very recently on using machine learning and artificial intelligence for database systems. So you will usually see me teaching classes that have the word data somehow embedded <laughs> in the title. Uh, this coming semester and hopefully you know, next, next year as well, I'm introducing a new class in data science, so data management in data science. And the goal of the class is to introduce to students uh, pipelines, data science pipelines, how do we build them, what are the steps, going from data cleaning to integration, uh, machine learning, and what data management techniques we need to handle big data, uh, analytics, data visualization. So I'm hoping this is gonna be a, a class that's gonna have big, you know, it's gonna have with big interest to many of our students. Um, when I don't teach that, I usually teach uh, distributed databases, um, but the goal there is to see how databases work on the cloud, how databases work in a distributed environment, uh, how do we partition data, we all heard the word big data and analytics, when we have big data we cannot store them in one location, so what are the algorithms, what are the approaches we use to decide where to place the data, how do we split them in different chunks, uh, how algorithms for processing information change once the information is not located in one server, but they are distributed across multiple servers. And so these classes, the description of these classes give you an idea of what type of the research topics that I'm working on, so they're all related to that. And what I look with my students is how we try to use data science techniques and machine learning, but to improve database systems. So how can we make them faster? How can we make them smarter? Can they learn databases, learn from you know, uh, experiences from running queries that they didn't run you know, very well in the past? What can we learn from that? What patterns can we extract? And how can we rebuild databases so that they can actually um, address the needs of today's big data analytics? Um, so this is pretty much what I had to um, I had to say about my my research. I look forward to seeing um, many of you hopefully in 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 my classes. Uh, I want to say that I very often work with students, master students, um, um, in my research projects. So I always look for you know I always have opportunities for for students to get involved in my research and many of them they get a lot of hands-on experience building we actually build prototypes we demonstrate them in conferences um, and so that is you know helps students also get very hands-on experience see how an actual system works but also if they're interested later on in more research work they do get publications out of it so I really find a lot of joy in working with students that they take these classes and then they find interest in these topics and we work together for a semester in an independent study. Great, great. Thank you, Ola. Um, and now uh, Pito has uh, some remarks to talk about some of his classes which are also really very interesting. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Pito Salas, and uh, I my teaching and my interests are all around software engineering. So uh, um, I come to Brandeis uh, from industry, have been worked there as in the software business for years, and I've been at Brandeis now for almost 10 years. Uh, and the so I, 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 I kind of combine a lot of that experience with my teaching. Uh, the courses I uh, the, the first one I want to mention is the software engineering capstone course, which is a very uh, a kind of a full stack uh, trip through building a big complex uh, web based system with databases and app servers and uh, you know um, uh, web architectures and so on. Uh, we form teams of uh, four or so students. They come up with product ideas and we actually build it through the whole semester. And uh, we end the semester with a big show and tell, which uh, will be a little bit different next, well, maybe not the next semester when we're done with it, uh, where we have people from the industry come out and give their opinions and their feedback on what has been built. And that's a really cool, uh, cool course because students come out of that knowing that they can actually take on a project project that has a big uh, uh, actually delivered product uh, as a web application. Uh, the other course that I want to mention is um, the Software Entrepreneurship course, which is actually not a technical course, really. It's about uh, building a business around the software product, uh, computer product, okay, hardware or software. Uh, in that case, we're um, essentially getting students to uh, 
come up with the ideas and then test them out in the market by doing interviews and building prototypes, building mockups and, and ending up with a kind of a business plan presentation. Uh, and then the last course I wanna mention is the um, uh, autonomous robotics course, which is the newest uh, one uh, that I teach, uh, where we are actually um, building um, uh, little autonomous robots uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, see, I have a, a prop, which is always nice. <laughs> and um, these little guys uh, travel around. In the case of COVID, they travel around mazes that we build in our own basements. Uh, but uh, we do have a, a robotics lab where if it's not for COVID, we'll be working in there. And it's really an introduction to robotics. So uh, we start from the very basics of how, how robots work and how they sense and how they move and how they figure out where they are. We deal with cameras and LIDARs and depth cameras and so on. And, it, and, and like all my courses, it's very hands-on. So students are actually developing software, building robots that run mazes or find objects or uh, uh, solve, uh, chase each other um, uh, and so on. And, and again, uh, that class is, is, um, uh, is pretty new. And so it's pretty small still, uh, but it's really a lot of fun. And, and uh, people, we bring in speakers from industry who have, uh, knowledge of, uh, of how robots are used in the real world. And that's, that's really fun as well. So like everybody else said, um, uh, I hope some of you end up at Brandeis and I get a chance to, to meet you and work with you. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Pito. Um, let's see, Jim, do you want to talk a little bit about what you teach in your research areas? Jim Storer? Sure, I'm Jim Storer and uh, on alternate years, uh, the graduate courses I teach are either a data structures and algorithms course or a course that I call Data Compression and Multimedia, which is more related to the research that I do. In fact, one of my students, Solomon, can you, can you wave your hand, is on here right now. Uh, and like lots of other people in the department, uh, deep learning is having a bigger and bigger effect in my research. For example, Solomon right now is working on compression. For example, for a soccer game, he will use deep learning to extract the players who can be represented at higher quality and he'll, uh, for the background, which could be done at lower quality, instead of a mean squared error type thing, he'll do a visual thing where he actually uses Fourier analysis to generate similar trees, trees that are blowing in the wind at the same rate the wind is picking up and going down, but using almost no bandwidth at all for a pleasing background where the bandwidth can be used for the players who are actually playing, uh, that sort of thing. So that's, that's something he's working on, for example, right now. Um, but if you want to see more about my research, you can always go to the web page it's linked to from the department page and it summarizes some of the recent uh, projects. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, let's see, we also have, uh, let's see, Chushu, you want to talk a little bit about your, uh, Chushu is a very new faculty, just came in uh, this semester, um, and you can talk about your research and yeah, uh, um, hello everyone. I'm, I'm Tu Xi Zhang. I'm a new assistant professor at the computer science department. So my research is about uh, data mining, machine learning, and deep learning. So particularly for the application in the uh, cloud mining and recommended system, time series analysis, and some interdisciplinary uh, uh, studies. So currently I teaching the course of cloud mining and deep learning. So as you know, deep learning is very, uh, very popular and very hard uh, in today's uh, computer science. So uh, I hope uh, if uh, you can um, take this course, um, uh, deep learning course or the ground mining course. Right? So I think that's all. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and let's see who else, who else is here. Well, Iraklis, you're going to talk a bit later about queer stuff. Um, I guess you could talk now if you want about your courses you teach and your uh, research interests. Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Iraklis Tsekouraikis, and I'm also a fairly, a fairly new member uh, of the uh, computer science department. Um, so I'm currently teaching uh, core courses in the department. So I'm teaching uh, the course I attend, the introduction to problem solving in Python. If you don't have a uh, previous programming experience, we're going to work together to build a solid foundation uh, in computer science, the fundamental skills in computer science. Um, I'm also I'm going to be teaching in the spring the course I12, which is the advanced uh, programming in Java. 
Uh, so if you uh, succeed in the placement exam, we're going to be working together also for um, uh, the advanced programming uh, with the COSI 12. Uh, I'm also teaching the um, uh, fourth core uh, program or the fourth core uh, course, which is the operating systems course. Um, so in any of the uh, these courses, we're going to be working together if you join Brandeis. Uh, for my research, I do research in computer vision, which is a very exciting area. One of the most exciting aspects of it is that you can actually visualize your results. Uh, computer vision uh, comprises of a, um, a set of methods of how the computers can understand what they're, they, what they're seeing through the cameras. Uh, and I'm mostly uh, specializing in the area of 3D computer vision. So I'm working on creating 3D models uh, from captures or from scenes that are captured by cameras uh, and they are received by the computer. Um, Wait. So these are the courses I'm teaching. Um, I'm really excited to uh, meet you virtually here, and I uh, hope to meet you as well in person at some point when you join Brandeis as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Heraklis. Um Here, why don't I talk a little bit about my teaching and research also. So I teach, um, right now I'm teaching a uh, 3D animation course, which is really modeling 3D animation and VR, uh, virtual reality app design. So here I have like a... VR set. So we learn how to build virtual reality applications. Um, and I'm also teaching the Python course. I'm teaching an asynchronous version of the same course Iraqus is teaching. Um, for my research, I do work on uh, educational technology, build and study a lot of educational technology tools for helping you learn Python or calculus. Um, I also do work with brain computer interaction. So here I have a one more prop. Uh, this little thing here, which you can put over your head like that. It reads your brain waves from four electrodes, sends it to your, your uh, phone or your computer. Um, and we're using it to see whether or not we can apply machine learning algorithms to detect what kind of things people are doing. Are they doing math problems? Are they doing reading problems? Are they relaxing? Are they daydreaming? Are they meditating? Um, and it's, it's, yeah, really, really interesting. You may have noticed almost all the faculty do something with machine learning. Um, there are some that do it, actually build new machine learning algorithms, like Chushu. Uh, and there are almost everybody else that is using applied machine learning in, in their research, just because it's the, it's the really nice new tool that has uh, gained prominence in the last few years. It's extremely powerful and just gets more powerful every couple of years. Um, I also teach courses in, in uh, uh, computer graphics, so actually building uh, you know, graphic systems that do ray tracing um, and learning how to program the GPUs the, with the, the shaders and um, the very low level GPU programming languages. Um, and so uh, I also look forward to seeing some of you if you decide to come to Brandeis. Uh, I'll be teaching core classes and also uh, classes in graphics and animation. So let me go back to the uh, slideshow, if I can. Here we go, yay. Uh, all of our faculty are involved in some kind of research. Um, and here are just a few of the labs um, that we haven't really talked about too much. So there's, well, PITO's Autonomous Robotics Teaching Laboratory. Um, Jordan Pollack has this Dynamic and Evolutionary Machine Organization lab. So he's done a lot of work on um, on evolutionary algorithms, another kind of machine learning, and robots that build robots, and artificial life, lots of really interesting work. Uh, Rick Altman does a lot of work with design and um, you know, learning how to uh, use human-computer interaction principles to design really effective uh, graphical user interfaces. Um, there's also the Lab for Linguistics and Computation. We have a really internationally well-known lab for linguistics, computational linguistics, uh, and Chinese language processing too, which Bert leads. Um, here, I'll, I'll just quickly go and look at all the faculty, so you can see. Yes, yeah, so Rick Alterman does educational technology, computer smart learning, data, Mitch Cherniak does systems, database, big data, uh, Antonella, um, does work in algorithms and uh, pattern recognition. 
Uh, Lotus Goldberg does work in theoretical syntax. She's a, a linguist. Um, I talked about the stuff I do. Uh, also, I do game design, and it's using games to study um, very psychological issues. Um, Peng Yu Hong is uh, another one of our um, machine learning specialists, also does bioinformatics and image processing. Um, and so the research is interesting because you may be able to work in their research labs, and at least they're, you know, all of these faculty are like at the cutting edge of their research area, right? So when they teach a course, they really know what's going on in the course. Uh, Hong Fu Liu also is a biomatics machine, bioinformatics machine learning specialist. Uh, Constantine does natural language processing, computational linguistics. Um, Harry Marison is a uh, is theoretical computer science, and now he's doing a computational instrument design uh, using kind of computer science techniques to model violins and Stradivariuses and try to understand why they give the sound they do and to be able to 3D print models for them. It's pretty interesting. Uh, Sophia Malamud is a, another linguist. Um, uh, Marie Mathieu is a specialist in um, spoken dialogue design and uh, building systems that are speech, work with speech understanding. Um, Olga, we've already, she's already talked about her teaching and research. Keith Plaster is a, another linguist. Um, so we're a department of computer science and linguistics. And computational linguistics is a big part of uh, computer science these days. And we have a really strong group in that area. And you can take courses in that, even if you're not in the master's program for computational linguistics. Um, James Posiewski also does computational linguistics and AI and uh, machine learning. Uh, Peter Salas has already talked about his, his work and also does a lot of work in educational technology. Uh, Luba Schreira is another systems big data database person. Uh, Jim Storer I talked with us briefly a minute ago. Uh, Bert. Oh, and Pang Yu is here. Maybe Pang Yu, why don't you talk about your work? Okay. Uh, I'm working on machine learning and its applications in a variety of fields, like in biology, chemistry, physics. Uh, 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 we are now, my lab is now in, associated with the three national center right now. Uh, one, is, uh, one is with uh, two with materials on different concentration. One is more chemistry, another one is more physics. Uh, another one is, uh, is uh, primary on uh, biochemistry part. And our applications areas, including uh, FinTech, uh, financial technology, uh, education, or uh, we call intelligent education, and uh, medical informatics. And I teach, in terms of courses, I teach artificial intelligence, uh, statistical machine learning, bioinformatics, and uh, uh, practice, uh, practical machine learning with big data. Yeah. Uh, so starting this year, we are uh, forming a strong machine learning curriculum. Uh, the reason we want to do that because there's a huge demand in industry. And of course, also research area in many other fields. So machine learning is everywhere right now. And we uh, welcome students who have passion about machine learning and its applications to join us at Brandeis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And what about Bert? Do you want to talk about your research a little bit, Bert? Uh, sure. Um, so my research area is in uh, natural language processing. Uh, so that covers a lot of things in these days, right? So from uh, information extraction to machine translation to, you know, like a, a spoken language understanding. Um, so I'm mostly um, focusing on uh, the fundamentals of uh, NLP, you know, such as you know, which forms the basis of these applications, like understanding the uh, semantics of uh, structures like, you know, like uh, the meaning of language um, the syntactic structures um, and uh, the, the structure of the you know of a text and so, and so which can potentially be useful for a lot of languages um, so the course i'm teaching uh, in, one of them is the machine learning approaches to natural language processing so that's my area of uh, research uh, the other one is to uh, is for uh, you know 
developing data sets uh, for machine learning um, you know, models, right? So we, you know, machine learning models do not work without, uh, without data sets. So in terms of actual research, um, NLP is a very wide um, field. Um, so it, you know, it's from uh, information extraction to uh, spoken language understanding to you know, dialogue systems to, you know, um, so there's a lot of things, but uh, my research is mostly in the fundamental problems uh, which uh, you know, can be, uh, you know, like which, which is kind of like important to solve those problems in order to, for these applications to work. Uh, so those include in, um, understanding the semantic structure, you know, of language, um, the, the, the structure of a text. Um, so in order to uh, facilitate, you know, like the, uh, all, all of those downstream applications. Great, thank you. So let me share my screen again. Um, so now, uh, can we all see Bert and Iraklis here? That's great. So and, uh, Iraklis already talked a little bit about his uh, teaching and research. And, um, and then we have Chushu, who also already talked about his research. And that's our faculty currently. Um, we're, um, you know, we're growing. Our department is steadily growing. So uh, we may have new faculty by next year or the year after. Uh, we're certainly looking to grow. Next, I'm going to have Iraklis talk a little bit about careers and internships and uh, how that works here at Brandeis. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, well, that's one of the uh, very exciting parts of my uh, job here in the department. Uh, one of the most gratifying aspects of our work as educators is to see our students succeed after they're done with their studies at Brandeis. So I'm very excited to serve as the industry liaison and the career advisor in the department. Uh, Brandeis offers um, amazing resources for students to prepare for uh, a successful career after their studies at uh, the uh, university. So uh, we have the um, uh, Hyatt Center, the Career Center, which is an institute-wide uh, office that uh, serves all the students in the school or in the university and uh, has a lot of opportunities to prepare um, to prepare you for your career, but also to uh, make connections with the uh, industry. But more specifically for graduate students, we have the uh, Graduate School uh, of Arts and Sciences Center for Career Development, which is an amazing resource. Uh, and here on this slide, you can see uh, a few of the services that you can actually take advantage of as uh, students at Brandeis. Uh, but now one exciting aspect here is that even as alumni, so if you get a degree from Brandeis, you get career services for life from this office. Uh, so what uh, you can do with this office, you can actually uh, have a uh, connect with a career advisor via a video call. So you can have a one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting with them. Uh, you can self-schedule the appointment through the uh, Handshake platform uh, and get remote career advising. They also have office hours every week that you can actually drop in and discuss any questions you may have regarding your uh, preparation for your career. Uh, they do offer uh, resume reviews via email, so you can submit your uh, resume via email and get feedback on how you can improve your resume, make it more attractive for companies. Um, and I want to mention here Handshake. This is an amazing platform with many resources. You can use this platform, create an account as a uh, current student at Brandeis, uh, set it to public, and this actually is going to make your uh, profile available to all the employers that collaborate with our university and they're looking for filling specific positions. Um, they do offer a lot of opportunities to, uh, for networking as well. The community of our current students, our faculty and our alumni is a very connected community and you can get a lot of uh, benefits from working uh, with networking, making connections and uh, taking advantage of all these opportunities. Um, I personally work also with the students as the industry liaison of the department. So. Uh, besides all the services from the uh, Graduate School of Arts and Sciences the, uh, the, and the Career Center specifically, you can also work with me individually. So I work on uh, with students on one-on-one -on -one meetings. I can give you more uh, technical uh, a, a feedback on your resume from a technical perspective, from a computer science perspective. And I can also uh, discuss with you what you want to do with your career after your studies at uh, Brandeis. Um, and we can discuss about courses you may take as, uh, you know, as part of your degree in order to follow and succeed in the uh, specific area that you want to follow. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, we have some more exciting information to share with you. 
Um, one of the most exciting things that we have actually experienced during these challenging times that uh, we're facing now is that our students are not really affected when it comes to hiring. Uh, so there is a lot of employers, specifically in computer science, we haven't been really affected by that. So students have been teaching over the past few years and they graduated uh, over the last few months. All of them managed to get a, a very successful position. Uh, some, of the some of my students, they actually had a change on their starting date. Some of them, they had to start remotely, but all of them were able to find a very good position during this time. So that's very exciting for, for us to see our students succeed even during those times. Um, and just to give you some data here uh, for careers in computer science, in 2019, the uh, website code.org and the uh, Computer Science Education Coalition estimated that we have we're going to have more than 475,000 computing job openings in all sectors, uh, yet we only have about 50,000 computer science students graduate per year. So the demand for computer science um, is impressive, in my opinion, and the career opportunities is the last thing you need to be concerned if you follow this, uh, the studies in computer science. Um, one of the uh, things that we advise our students is to expand your search. So computer scientists and software engineers, uh, they actually are needed in many different industries. Uh, I want to mention here that software drives innovation. We have, of course, the uh, software positions in tech companies, which is the case always for uh, many students follow this path. But the thing is that software is also now redefining existing businesses. Uh, for example, in automotive industry, um, and I don't even uh, go here to uh, driverless cars and all these job openings that are actually created now by using machine learning to create driverless car technology. But even an average car today has millions of lines of codes of code embedded in the uh, actual computer of the car. Uh, so there's a lot of computing jobs out there as well. Uh, not to even to mention finance uh, system rec recommendation systems, as uh, Juzu mentioned before. Uh, but I was recently reading an article about uh, a Google project that uh, works with agriculture companies in order to use data science and improve the efficiency of agricultural methods. So there is uh, a lot of existing businesses that are redefined with our discoveries in computer science. And of course, software is also creating a lot of new businesses that didn't exist before. Uh, just to mention a, a huge sector, which is the computer secu security, the software security. Uh, which uh, has a, uh, an increasingly uh, demand in the market as well. Um, we also have on this slide a lot, a lot of useful links uh, that you can follow after you get the, uh, these uh, slides from our presentation today. So you can see that there's a lot of companies hiring right now. Uh, there is a uh, link here from Handshake, uh, one from uh, which is actually crowdsourced from Candor. You can find a lot of companies that are hiring right now. And specifically, specifically for computer science, what we have experienced over the past few months, the hiring has not really been affected by that. We also have a link here for the Career Center of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So you can see a lot more of these resources you can use as our brand day students. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Heraklis. Um, let's go, we have, uh, Actually, let me talk a, one more thing about this was that we do have every October a big career fair with 30 to 40 companies coming and, you know, all of our students going. A lot of people get internships and jobs through that. Um, and it's great for the students. And it's great for the companies, too. Um, and we do have a, we're, we have a, uh, we know our alumni, right? So once you graduate, you're part of our alumni network and you continue to use that networking. Um, through the service or just by knowing people. Okay, so I think we're now at the stage where we're going to uh, have a Q&A with students and the uh, COSI staff. So um, uh, I can introduce the students, some of them here. So uh, Fernando, uh, Arturo Estrella, you want to talk, tell us a little bit about yourself? And then I'll have Erica uh, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Hi, I'm Fernando. Uh, I recently graduated uh, from the master in Brandeis. I really enjoyed it. Um, I am from Dominican Republic. I did a undergrad in electrical engineering. 
And um, I was working in industry and then I got an um, email because I did the GRE and then it's like uh, they share your email with interested universities and then I saw Brandis and I applied and he was happy every time. <laughs> <After that. laughs> yeah. Um, I, it was two years, I really enjoyed it. Um, I explored the university a lot. I, I got in many organizations. I uh, worked a lot with uh, the department, even in the office and in, with, with um, Michael specifically. Yeah, I got a job through a different, like it's not directly done uh, with Medtronic, it's through a different company uh, that manages the human resources. Uh, I'm working with, uh, with a one-year contract uh, that I started like two months ago with Medtronic, the very, very large um, medical devices uh, company, the biggest in the world right now. Um, right now I'm working as an IT, they call it IT developer. Um, let's, say, let's see what I can share. <laughs> um, I am basically helping them do something useful with the manufacturing uh, data that they're generating. Uh, they can see it, use it, etc. And uh, it's with a unique software. Uh, so it's not like I'm actually coding, but um, the concepts are, were very useful from what I learned. I would say it's definitely very important to go deeper into this thing called uh, design patterns. Design patterns in software engineering. Uh, I didn't need to go deeply, too deeply while in Brandis, but it's very useful in the real world. <laughs> um, so, and I also worked a little bit with the Maker Lab people, which was an extremely interesting experience. I can talk about more if you're really interested, but that's what I wanted to say. So. That's great. Yeah, so let's have uh, Erica introduce herself and talk a little bit about her experience. And Tom and Solomon are PhD mm -hmm. So Erica, you want to uh, talk a little about your experience? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Erica. I graduated from the MS program in May, um, and I actually really enjoyed Rick Alterman's classes. He teaches classes on human-computer interaction. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just taking a few additional courses in there. I'm trying to build a portfolio, and I'm hoping to work in the area of UX and UI design. Okay, great. Um, and then how about uh, Tom? Want to talk about your experience? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Tom. Um, I, I came in through the, the MS4 pro program as well. Um, and I came in with um, very little, almost no, you know, programming experience. I worked uh, for a couple of years in the publishing industry as a book editor. Um, but I found um, the courses they had to offer. There's some really great courses um, and um, got into it, enjoyed it, and um, ended up joining the PhD program here. Uh, where right now I'm doing research with Professor Jordan Pollock um, in artificial intelligence and in uh, reinforcement learning specifically. So those are the types of algorithms where they're able to play games at like a superhuman level and that sort of thing. So yeah, uh, thank you guys for coming. And how about uh, Solomon? You want to talk about your experience at Brandeis? Yeah, um, so I started at Brandeis uh, in the MS4 program. I was a math major in undergrad, but you really don't have to have done some quantitative major for your undergrad to succeed in the uh, program. Uh, we get people from all different disciplines. Uh, and yeah, and now I'm a PhD student. I study computer vision and uh, uh, video compression. Jim was describing it a bit earlier. And uh, um, yeah. Okay. yeah, great. I see, I see that uh, Hong Fu just uh, showed up, another one of our machine learning faculty. Do you want to introduce yourself briefly, Hong Fu, and talk about your teaching and research? Hello, everyone. I'm Hong Fu Liu. I'm the kind of junior faculty at Brandeis Computer Science Department. And my research is focused on data mining, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And currently, I'm teaching several courses. For example, one is unsupervised learning and the data mining, we will talk about some unsupervised tasks, for example, clustering, outlier detection, feature selection. And I will also 
uh, will teach them advanced courses in terms of the domain applied courses related to machine learning. For example, computer vision recommendation systems. Okay, great, wonderful, thank you. So I think, I think we, did we get, get all the students? Um, Brandeis students? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, great. So um, next we have a uh, question and answer. Were there any questions in the... Um, what are the benefits of doing this program over a specialized CS boot camp? Um, so I guess I can take a stab at that. Um, CS boot camp, uh, it is, you're focused on uh, usually just learning one piece of technology, maybe full stack development in Ruby on Rails with Postgres as the database behind it, something like that. Um, which which uh, which is actually an, an important need, you know, and that there is a, a need for people with those kind of skills. But what you don't get is the um, uh, kind of the deeper understanding. So you're not going to be as valued as an employee. You're someone they can sit down and they can have you do something, but you're not going to know that, that sorting takes n log n time and that if you write your code this way, it's going to be super slow. If you write it that way, it's going to be really fast. You're also not going to know about all the latest machine learning algorithms and being able to think about how you could incorporate machine learning into some particular project you're trying to work on, uh, or human human computer inter interaction, uh, or design. So the um, you become a, a uh, much fuller, more uh, fully formed computer scientist by doing this program than doing a um, specialized CS boot camp. Anybody else want to? Add on yes, that? I'd actually love to chime in and just add one more thing to what you said. And um, because I've recently done some research on those programs, um, one of the differentiating factors, one of the many differentiating factors, but I find very important myself is that most of those are taught by industry professionals that are not necessarily excellent at teaching. They're doers. So you'll be taught by someone who does the job now but not by someone who is a career educator and can maybe recraft the message if you need to hear it a different way. Um, whereas a college program is taught by people that have done nothing but devote their life to also learning the content, but also teaching the content. So your student experience will be different. And also the faculty here are really, they really are at the cutting edge of research, right? So you're, or someone who's, uh, an industry professional, they may know that particular domain really well, but they're not really designing new machine learning algorithms or looking at new computational linguistics models or uh, looking at new ways of doing uh, human computer interaction. Uh, so, okay, uh, how long does the program take when taken full time? Um, so, there's um, it's uh, anybody else want to take that? It's four semesters. Yep. Full time. Uh, it's I think possible to do it faster, especially if you have like some if you're coming in with some computer science credits from undergrad. Yep. Um, Typically four semesters. Sometimes, however, we we also have a an option uh, to stay an extra fifth semester and just build a project, uh, like a, a master's project. So we have a few students that want to do that. They take their four semesters, um, but then they want to really supercharge their resume. So they'll stay an extra semester and just work full time on their own project to build their e-portfolio. Uh, clearly very optional, but um, it's actually a nice buffer, you know, in the case the market goes down temporarily and they aren't hiring as much, you can do this extra buffer and stay for an extra semester. Um, but yeah, typically uh, four semesters. And you can, let's see. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Tim, I was just going to say about the fifth semester, too. It's at like a greatly reduced tuition. And if you yeah. actually TA that last semester, you can you can almost do it for free. So it's actually worth it if you're hesitating and want a little bit more experience before you go out in the great big world, you know. Um, and you can also take, uh, um, you may be able to take summer school classes. Uh, to to uh, progress through your career, so you could do it in four semesters: fall, spring, summer, fall. 
uh, if you wanted, um, if you're really intense. Um, another one, I'm a biochemistry major in undergrad and I'm also interested in medicine. What are some examples of jobs that could integrate science and or medicine and computer science? Well, I can say we had in our lab, Adi, uh, he just graduated and he's been working at Path AI here in Boston, which is a company that does AI-based diagnostics and uh, um, uh, like treatment recommendations for cancer patients. They're analyzing really high resolution scans of tissues and stuff like that. And, 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 you know, I think, especially in the Boston area, there seems to be a million companies and uh, biotech is just getting more and more computational. You can really get jobs in that field, even if you didn't have this uh, biochem background, which obviously having that is going to be a benefit. And, it, you know, you have that plus tech, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of companies that are interested in that kind of uh, resume. Yeah, typically about a third of the companies in our computer science career fair are med tech kind of companies, healthcare companies. So there's a, a huge market there. I think Pongi was doing work with, um, uh, got data from a hospital about patients, Alzheimer's patients, and was do, using machine learning to predict uh, mortality, who was in danger of dying in, within the next year. So you can do some really, really interesting work that way. And if you know that, that lets you focus your care more on the people that are more fragile. So I think there, um, machine learning especially can have some really big impacts. Or like cancer, it's like there's a million different specific stages and types and all yep. of that can be diagnostically tricky to figure out. But And also, uh, uh, I think uh, James was working doing, uh, re applying computational linguistics to uh, journal articles about coronavirus, and there are something like fifteen to twenty thousand of those articles, right? Uh, but so we wanted to get information quickly to be able to ans answer questions about them, and you can't just read fifteen thousand articles, right? But a computer can, <laughs> right? And ideally, try to harvest some information to allow you to answer some kinds of questions. Uh, can I answer? A What's that? Bit? Yeah, go. Yeah, I just read, I'm just reading it right now again. Uh, Medtronic bought a startup from some, some people in Israel. They were, it's called Neutrino Health, and they created an app which lets users, I'm reading it right now, which lets users see how food and lifestyle choices affect their glucose levels. The technology using machine learning to analyze a trove of nut nutritional data plus information that streams in from users, glucose monitors, and wearables. Mm. Yeah. And also, depending on how how much you think that we will need um, for the Mars exploration <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and all that chemistry information and how you see that moving, which uh, there are people that want it to move a lot, then that will be very important. <laughs> No, it's, it's, yeah. Um, and you can also, th there are some of our students go out and start companies also. So there's a lot, and there's a um, Spark program that has $50,000 in money that they distribute to three or four winners of the Spark grant competition. Uh, and they offer courses in entrepreneurship, practical issues in entrepreneurship. Um, so if you're interested in kind of taking what you learn and trying to start a company, you can do that too. And we've had some very successful companies over the years. In Siri, Siri was created by a brand I salam. Um, I, I have uh, yeah, something to contribute here as well. Sure. Um, so for there's a lot of intersections of computer science and medical applications. One of the main com most common ones that was mentioned before is the health informatics and how machine learning and data science can be used to extract information for um, and diseases we didn't know before. But there is also a big part of computer vision that has applications in uh, medical areas as well. Uh, one of my collaborators from the past, they actually uh, just started a startup that uses uh, computer vision algorithms on uh, pathology images in order to uh, come up with a, an immunotherapy treatment for cancer. So there's many applications of uh, medical images, computer vision uh, algorithms in order to uh, help with medical applications as well. It's an amazingly exciting time to be alive and to be in this area, right? 
It's just all kinds of things happening all the time and lots of promise. It's a lot of hard work, <laughs> right, to uh, develop those skills, but it's extremely rewarding too. Um, and you can always uh, send email to the department if you have further questions. We're all happy, happy to help. Um, or to individual faculty too. Our emails are on the course website, so you can send anybody a fa uh, email and ask a question. I guess I could. I would just briefly say about the boot uh, the the boot camp uh, thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think getting the masters it it gives you a chance to get a feel for the field and the different uh, subfields and categories of things you might be interested in doing and like. Uh, those boot camps are very targeted, uh, so uh, not being in the field, you probably don't know what you want to do going in. Uh, I think it gives a good chance to, to try different things out and see what's working for you. Yep. Also, if you want to do research, I mean, there's not really an option. Yeah. Yeah, it opens up the possibility of going on to a PhD program, which you might not be even thinking about now, but you take a few courses and get involved in a little research and you might really love it. So, um, okay, well, thank you everybody for coming and uh, let us talk about our program with you. Um, if you have any feedback, we'd be glad to hear it. So, see you.